So, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and esteemed attendants, welcome to our panel discussion on current issues for monetary policy transmission in Europe. My name is Katrin Assenmacher and I am heading the stress test modeling division at the ECB. Today, I have the honor to moderate a panel with a distinguished group of experts who will delve into the intricacies and uh, complexities of monetary policy transmission in the euro area. Central bankers need to know how their actions reverberate through the economy, influencing key variables such as interest rates, inflation, and economic growth. This has always been challenging, but even more so in recent times, owing to unprecedented shocks, multiple ongoing structural changes, the extension of the monetary policy toolkit, and a dramatic turnaround from too low to too high inflation. Let me first introduce our panelists who are bringing a wealth of knowledge and diverse perspectives to our discussion. They are partly here with us at the ECB and partly joining remotely. I'm going in alphabetical order and I'd like to start with Silvia Adagna, who is Managing Director and Head of European Economics Research at Barclays and joins us from London. She leads a team covering Euro area economies and the UK and some of the small open European, area, uh, European economies. Next, I'm sure that everybody in the room here knows Mario Centeno, who is governor at the Banco de Portugal and member of the governing council of the European Central Bank. He held various notable positions before, in particular as president of the Eurogroup and chair of the board of governors of the European Stability Mechanism and was finance minister of Portugal. Then, next to me, we have Benoit Moujon, who is Head of Economic Analysis at the Bank for International Settlements. And before joining the BIS, he was Director of Monetary and Financial Studies at the Banque de France. And finally, our panel is completed by Ricardo Reich, who is the A.W. Phillips Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics. He surely is also very well known to this audience. For his academic work, he received various prizes, and he also acts as an academic advisor at many central banks and other organizations. So now, without any further ado, let us start listening to the uh, statements of our panelists, and we will start with a set of opening statements of about five to seven minutes from each of the panelists before engaging in an exchange of views among them. And finally, we will also open up the floor to questions from the audience. So, as uh, starting will be Benoit, so Benoit, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm very uh, fond of this, uh, of this conference. It shows that uh, research on the transmission of monetary policy in, uh, in the Euro system is uh, is uh, alive and kicking, it's very dynamic, it's very uh, topical and super interesting. I, I learned a lot uh, yesterday and, and this morning uh, already. So uh, I want to, to basically focus on, uh, on the recent experience and what it means uh, for monetary policy and the credibility of, uh, in particular, the inflation targeting framework uh, of, uh, of central banks uh, to, to stabilize inflation. So. Um, M many of you would know this, uh, this quote from, from uh, John uh, Gospel, uh, and, and it's basically taking place uh, in the history of, uh, of Jesus Christ after he's been crucified. Um, you know, some, of, uh, some start to believe that uh, he, he was uh, back to life, but Thomas was skeptical. You know, he, 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 he wanted to see uh, he wanted to see uh, Jesus Christ uh, alive and, and, and test uh, his wants to, 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 to believe that indeed uh, he was back to life. And, and to some extent, uh, this, uh, uh, this recent experience that we, are, that we have had with a very high inflation, central banks tightening interest rates vigorously, late but vigorously, uh, which brought back inflation back very close to the target in, in, in the case of the, uh, of the euro area, is, is, is actually, it's an experience of uh, the transmission of monetary policy working through the anchoring of inflation expectations. And while until 2022, 2023, you might have thought that 
you know, this expectation mechanism that we know is, is, is very powerful in the models that we use to think about monetary policy, that, you know, this was essentially an assumption and a matter of faith. Now we live through it. Uh, until then, you could say, well, you know, it's a great moderation. Inflation expectations are anchored. Uh, they are flat, but inflation itself, it's flat. And between these two flat things, you know, the correspondence was a matter of, uh, you, you could argue, was a matter of, of faith. Now, for uh, uh, very many observers, uh, we, we've seen that if you tighten monetary policy, you manage to get this inflation. Uh, uh, and, and, and you manage to get this inflation uh, not as much through lowering or, or slowing uh, uh, aggregate uh, uh, demand. Okay, there, is, there was some of that, but given the slope of the Phillips curve that we estimate, the bulk of the disinflation did not come from slowing uh, the economic activity. And actually, we think of the current experience as a soft landing uh, disinflation. So uh, actually, I, I think, you know, I'd, I'd like in this uh, house uh, to, to, to mention Otmar Ising, uh, and that's where I started my, my career. And, you know, Otmar Ising was really stressing there's no such thing as a track record. And, and I think that the recent experience is one where the track record of um, uh, stabilizing inflation has, has reached uh, another level. It's, it's, it's more credible now after the experience that we've had than it had been until uh, uh, until, until now. So uh, basically, that's, uh, that's the first point. Um, uh, I want to, to illustrate briefly, uh, you know, how it worked, uh, how it worked in the model, and that's uh, uh, basically that we have this tightening, and the way we, we think of it at the BIS is that you have two regimes of inflation. You have a low inflation regime uh, with a lot of nice properties, including mean reversion, and so inflation will return towards the 2% target of, uh, of uh, the central bank. But if you leave this uh, low inflation regime and you, you fall into a high inflation regime, that's, uh, th that's not granted uh, at all. And so the way it works uh, here in, uh, in simulations that we described in, uh, in a December um, 23 BIS bulletin is, you know, inaction is reported here with uh, the yellow line. Okay, so if the central bank did not increase in it, its interest rate, what you see in the middle panel is that uh, core inflation would not have returned towards, uh, towards 2%. Two, 2%. The red and blue corresponds to two uh, hypotheses uh, we have on the formation of inflation expectations, whether with different degrees of credibility of, 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 the, of the inflation target. But really, the, the, the main message is that you needed to convince, uh, uh, you needed to convince uh, uh, um, the private sector uh, economic agents that you will stay in this low inflation regime. And uh, what this vigorous increase in interest rates that we've seen in 2022 and 2023, that's what it produced, that we stayed in this low inflation regime and, uh, and we saw uh, uh, inflation coming back uh, uh, very close to, to the target from double digit uh, uh, um, peak in the, in the euro area. So then what does this mean uh, uh, for, for, for uh, researchers uh, and, and analysts and, 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 and the staff of central banks who are trying to think about, you know, what, I, what is it useful to look at? What is it that you want to, to, to do research on? And, uh, and so basically, I think it's, it's about um, understanding better this credibility capital of central banks. And, uh, and, and so there are different places where you can look at. So there is uh, the time series dimension, uh, which uh, uh, you, know, you, you may be familiar with uh, inflation at risk uh, type of models, which uh, actually uh, is based uh, very much on, on research which was conducted at, at, the, at the ECB uh, uh, 15 to, to or 20 years ago, or published uh, in 2008. Uh, and, and so, you know, it became uh, 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 known under the, the label inflation, uh, inflation at risk. But I think there's also the cross-section moments of inflation expectations. Uh, there's work also on this uh, uh, about 15 years ago. But one thing that really very much struck me is when in, uh, in, in uh, 2021, uh, Ricardo Reis actually said, look, we start to see bimodality in the uh, distribution of inflation expectations. 
And when is it, when have we seen bimodality uh, in the past? Well, we had seen bimodality uh, in the early 70s. And so this really uh, started to, 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 to raise anxiety. So um, just a, a very uh, a few evidence on, on, uh, on uh, how you can go about trying to understand uh, uh, whether this credibility capital is at risk. Uh, first of all, there have been instances in the past in advanced economies, so A is here stands for advanced economies. So the, the red dots, you know, that's the distant past. Then, you know, the, the mean of inflation expectations was sensitive to uh, observed inflation. Uh, and the sensitivity has, has come down uh, in the inflation targeting regime. We also have evidence that in EMEs, you know, it took quite some time to lower the sensitivity of the mean of inflation expectations to observed uh, 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 inflation. That's moving from the yellow dots to, 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 to the blue dots. Now, uh, if you look at um, the variance, the cross-section variance of inflation expectations, which you can measure with disagreement, which is the interquartile range uh, of, uh, of uh, inflation expectations, uh, there you, you see that in the recent uh, episode, and going back to the observations that Ricardo had made, you saw some increase, okay? You saw, you saw some increase. So this was an alarm that we had to take very seriously, in my view. Now, uh, if, if, you, if you look at, uh, at disagreement, the disagreement time series on the left panel here, yes, it did increase a lot, but it's still relatively small, okay? Which is another sign that, you know, the credibility capital uh, maybe started to be at risk, but, uh, but maybe not so, not so much, so uh, uh, quantitatively uh, at least. So let me, uh, let me conclude. So uh, I think that really this, uh, this disinflation ex experience uh, that uh, uh, many people have had, um, and uh, that's financial markets uh, uh, and, uh, and, and observers, I think it lends a lot of credit to uh, this inflation targeting framework and to the type of models which put some emphasis on the expectation channel of monetary policy. And I think it's been critical to bring inflation down towards the, 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 the definition of price stability uh, at 2%. Uh, and in terms of research program uh, moving, uh, moving forward, I think it's, it's a very critical research program to try to get leading indicators of when this credibility capital is at risk. Okay, when we are moving out of uh, regions of, of, of stability as we labeled them in the BIS Annual Economic Report uh, uh, of 2023. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Bill. I'd like now to give the floor to Sylvia. Thank you very much, Katrina, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to start by thanking, obviously, you, Katrina, and Philip Hartman for inviting me to participate to this panel. Uh, it's really a great honor, and I'm really sorry I wasn't able to join you in person. But also on my side, I was able to listen to some of the papers, uh, to read some of the work of the network, and it's really excellent. I'm sure it would be uh, very influential also for us in the private sector. So um, I think uh, someone will share my presentation with you. Uh, in my introductory remarks, I will focus on uh, a possible divergence of monetary policy decisions across the two shores of the Atlantic. Now, this is a topic that it's making the media headlines, it's top of mind of investors, but clearly its possible consequences are of interest both for policymakers and, and I think for academics. Now, as Philip Hartman suggested in, in our prep call, there is a lot of drama around this potential divergence, but my goal in the next five minutes is to show you some data that hopefully will uh, clarify why there is not much drama to make around it. Now, the, if we can go to the next slide, uh, the work I will present is just based on a joint report that we published very recently with my colleague Mark Giannoni and uh, other teams of our European and US uh, groups. Uh, I will try to make three points. One is that a potential divergence in monetary policy actions between the Fed and the ECB 
that would lead to a wider nominal and real uh, policy rate gap uh, would just reflect contrasting macro conditions across the two shores of the Atlantic. The second point is that such a gap would not be unprecedented in historical terms. And the third point is that, uh, you know, a gap that is similar in size to what, for example, the market is now pricing, would not likely trigger a large depreciation of the currency of the exchange rate, and uh, that could call into question the entire normalization process of monetary policy in the euro area. So let me start with uh, showing some data on the divergence in macro conditions. If we can go to the next slide, uh, there are obviously many indicators that one can pick. Uh, here I'm just showing you uh, the differential between uh, real GDP growth rate between the US uh, and the euro area and uh, differentials in real output gaps. Now, uh, the latest data points available in both jurisdictions would put uh, these gaps at uh, 3% on the real GDP growth rate and 1.2% on real output gap metrics. And these are um, uh, sizable um, differences when we'll look um, on, uh, you know, on average uh, since the euro was introduced. In the next slides, you can see uh, the gap in inflation differentials. And whether you look at headline or core metrics, again, um, inflation rate very recently have uh, been um, about one percentage point higher in the US than in the Euro area. Now, uh, this obviously does not uh, tell us anything about implication for policy rates. But if we take standard, uh, you know, uh, tailor rules that are used in the literature, and uh, even though we know that there are obviously, you know, pitfalls to these rules, uh, we can show the possible scenarios of rates diverge quite a lot across the shore of the Atlantic. In the next slides, I just uh, copied, you know, um, the, what the Atlanta Fed produces, many different types of tailor rules um, interacted with the many different macro factors that allow to simulate the policy rate. And you can see from this heat map that the federal funds rate uh, in many uh, cases would uh, be kept constant, in others would be even suggested to be increased. Uh, and, you know, those who are read that would suggest a decrease from the current value would see a decrease to as much as, you know, uh, 1.25 basis point. If we go to the next slides, we uh, do some simulation of uh, various terror rules using various forecasts for the euro area. And uh, here you can see that uh, the median of these simulations would suggest uh, a much more sizable decrease in interest rate. No rules would suggest an increase in deposit rate. And uh, the, the decrease that all the terror rules would deliver would actually be even below what the market is currently pricing. Now, so uh, first point is that, again, I could show you many more metrics, but at least from these metrics, it seems that uh, clearly the macro conditions across the two uh, large blocks are different and would warrant differences in monetary policy rates. If we go to the next slides, I will just show you that even if this happens or uh, and uh, uh, the gap that we would see perhaps over the next six to 12 months would not be unprecedented from uh, an historical perspective. Actually, when we consider not just the difference in monetary policy rates, which is the slides on the left, but also, uh, you know, the differences in shadow rates that account for differences in uh, balance sheet policies and forward guidance between 2015 and 2018, uh, the gap was uh, sizably higher of what we could see in uh, the next few months. So again, second point, this gap is really not unprecedented from an historical standpoint. Uh, next slides will tackle, you know, what if it happens, what could be the consequences? Obviously, there could be many, uh, you know, many channels of transmissions, but one that is uh, often cited is the uh, FX channel. We all know how difficult it is to predict exchange rates, 
Um, now, uh, I think there is a strand of the literature that is quite successful. It started from the work of uh, West and, um, and Engel in 2014 that basically uses uh, Taylor rule, real-time Taylor rules to proxy uh, future returns of, of currencies. So I just put, you know, in the bottom of these slides uh, some, um, some uh, potential metrics using this, uh, this estimate from these coefficients. And it would tell you that if you take some sort of like all else equal differentials in inflation rates over the next six months, you know, the euro could depreciate by about two percentage points. But I think a, a more interesting question is, uh, I put it on the top, you know, what, what central bank will do? I mean, if you see from if if the divergence in monetary policy conditions between uh, the U.S. and the euro area comes because it is the U.S. that has macro conditions that are very different, not just from those of the euro area, but also from those of the main trading partners of the euro area. Now, the nominal effective exchange rate would certainly depreciate according you know, to this model, it's much less than the euro dollar. And if you look at the time series of the euro dollar and the nominal effective exchange rate, clearly you see that uh, the uh, latter is much less volatile than the euro dollar. I think it's also interesting to see that uh, you know um, the, the, the exchange rate is very volatile, but even between 2015 and 18, when there was a very large monetary policy divergence across the two shores of the Atlantic, the FX did not move. Um, in, in large size um, and, and as a trend continuously. Uh, last point that I want to make for to the next slide is just to uh, remind you of some research that uh, the ECB has done, which uh, tries to quantify the impact of currency depreciation on inflation. Obviously, this is a very, you know, uh, relevant topic. There is much research also beyond the one that I listed in this table. But I think what um, uh, what uh, is um, is uh, really um, you know um, interesting is the fact that um, the literature has shown that when you move along the value chain, the impact on exchange rate decre declines uh, quite a bit, and so the impact on HICP inflation tends to be quite small. The literature, however, is also point into uh, a point out that the, the effects could be nonlinear. So let me just conclude. And to conclude, I would say that, you know, if monetary policy decisions were to diverge over the next year, um, because macro condition and the limits of the two major central banks would require so, the FX channel is unlikely uh, to generate sustained large impulses to the nominal effective exchange rate. Now, the literature tell us that the impact on HICP inflation of plausible moves from the currency would not be sizable, and certainly uh, not of a magnitude that could really generate lots of drama around it, as, as Philip put it. Uh, however, there is obviously a caveat. I mean, the literature has also shown us that the effects could be nonlinear, and so uh, there could be at some point some responses of monetary decisions to to FX moves, uh, where these to become so large and so or too sharp or too fast to basically avoid any drama. So, with that, Catherine, I will pass the mic to you. Thank you very much, Sylvia. So then, yeah. <laughs> We now move on to um, Ricardo, who is here in the room. <laughs> yes, I am. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the last few years of inflation are really quite remarkable. It's, of course, because so many people in this room look at it so closely and so often, it's easy to forget how remarkable it is that we went from very justified fears of deflation to a very clear very high inflation in the space of 12 to 18 months. It is quite remarkable how inflation expectations measure tracked it so well to the point where the Phillips curve, which tends to collapse whenever we have an inflation episode, hasn't collapsed at all. The Phillips curve estimated in the 2010s fits very well the last few years. Output gap didn't move much, but the Phillips curve was very flat to start with. If you look at the expectations measured in some supplies, you can explain most of the inflation. Or thirdly, how even though there was fiscal um, developments in different countries that are similar insofar as increasing the present value of outlays, 
The timing of fiscal policy was quite different across regions, and yet the inflation effects were very similar. So whether you think about fiscal determinants, expectations, Phillips curves, or even the speed of adjustment, the behavior of inflation, while understandable, is still quite striking um, as you try to make sense of it and look a little more deeply into it. My comments are going to be on the very last part of the transmission of monetary policy, and that is a transmission from individual prices to overall aggregate inflation. And namely, I want to draw your attention, I only really have one slide, by the way, to what's been happening to the relative price dispersion, both in the euro area as well as in the US during these last few years, and to the likewise quite remarkable increase in that dispersion. Now, when we want to measure relative price dispersion, you have to be a little careful. There are several dimensions to it. Price dispersion could emerge because some firms raise their price by a lot and some by very little or it could emerge because some firms raised it today and another six months from now, so that the frequency that you should look at that dispersion and the extent to which we see whether today's, today's leader is tomorrow's laggard makes quite a bit of a difference in terms of not getting simply mechanical effects. You'll have to trust me, given my five minutes, that you have to do a little bit of econometrics to measure how much that dispersion is. But the fact is that starting right away in 2021, you see a remarkable increase in that dispersion, as proxy there by those two orange and yellow, uh, hopefully visibly clear um, indications of that dispersion. And that was common both in the US, these are across PCE sectors, or the euro area across HICP. And you can do CPI for the US as well. So this is both for the different regions as well as different measures of inflation. They were very large in terms of their increase and they have been declined, the dispersion has been declining quite significantly, coinciding, could be a coincidence, with the level of inflation. Telling us that there's at least hints that there's some important signal here. And third, that if one looks at it recently, very recently, since the beginning of this year, 2024, there is quite a bit of a difference in the US and the euro area with a much larger decline in relative price dispersion in the euro area, already getting back to close to pre-2020 levels. Whereas in the US, it seems to have been stuck at a persistently high level, perhaps mimicking what we see in headline inflation. How do we make sense of this? Or here are at least some attempts to spur the discussion about how to interpret that dispersion. To start with, if one takes a statistical approach to inflation, let us be careful not to make the sins that were made in 2021. And to, with this dispersion, one has to necessarily look at the components to try and make sense of what's driving inflation. But let's not go and cherry pick which index one looks at, as one sees much too often, because with this dispersion, a statistical consequence of it is that you can pick your favorite measure of inflation and me my favorite measure and end up with radically different versions. Luckily, we do have good statistical work for instance, here at the ECB, the principal components model, I forget what they call it, the underlying persistent price index, I think, or something, I don't know. So someone here from the ECB probably is going to build it. It's actually a very smart and well-built one. And it's one that, in terms of the current debate, is one that is has been falling since 2022 Q2. If you look at the different measures, potential measures of, again, taking randomly things out and ra not completely randomly and putting some random things in, core measures, and look at those systematic statistical measures, the statistical measures actually do quite well insofar as for DCB data, it's been falling, not just coinciding, but actually predating the actual fall in the measure of the HICP, and gives a word of optimism for what seems to be going on in terms of the data. But thinking more about those principal component type approaches, um, I think is a good thing to do, and one that has already shown its merit both in the last two years and I think over the next six months as well. Second, turning to economic theory, the relative price dispersion of 2021 was certainly a big driver or motivator of the theories that point to supply shocks. After all, if you have that the prices of some inputs go up in some sectors rather than others, you'd expect the relative price changes. Relative prices were taken almost as a confirmation that supply shocks had to be the, what was driving the high inflation. True, and very much indicative and should be inspiring. But at the same time, when one looks now a lot more deeply under the hood, 
the different supply shocks hitting different sectors seem to have been reflected more into stockouts, quantities across different sectors, and actually not explain a lot of the price variability that we observe in terms of that picture. And likewise, what has happened is that dynamically, now I look at the present and the future, the disappearance of many of these supply shocks, because they have turned out to be quite transitory, has not coincided with how much the relative price dispersion has fallen, and has trouble explaining the difference between the euro area and the US. So that immediate answer, while certainly has merit and explains some of it, does not seem to be enough. Third, the frequency of price adjustment. As we have an inflation episode, firms should start adjusting their prices more often. As they adjust their prices more often, we should expect at first that the relative price dispersion is higher as some start adjusting. But at the same time, if we transition to a more flexible price world, on the one hand, we'll have that idiosyncratic shocks cause more dispersion. But on the other hand, the big trends in expected inflation in monetary policy should come with less dispersion, because now everyone is adjusting at the same time as opposed to with the lags of frequency. And so the link between the frequency of price adjustment and this relative price dispersion, a classic question in economics that we've understood ever since we were looking at these things back in the 90s and 80s and thinking about menu costs and what they imply, is one that uh, can be used fruitfully and has already started being used, but I think much more can be done to make sense of that. But secondly, does also would have trouble explaining all of it, or at least raises an important question, which is that if indeed we've had a big change towards a more flexible price, or theories based on frequency of price dispersion should say that inflation is slow to rise, but quick to fall. Slow to rise because firms only start increasing their frequency of adjustment to the past shocks and what's going on. But then because the economy has become very flexible, inflation falls very quickly. Inflation has fallen quickly, but has it fallen, the fact that it's falling seemed quick, quicker in the euro area in the US is that to the frequency of price adjustment, we'll see. Fourth, expectations, but on that I won't mention much since Benoit has already mentioned it. The really key role of credibility, many of you, maybe most of you, although this is now disappearing from syllabi, I've learned about the Lucas Island model, which is exactly a model of credibility and the extent to which um, if we have very anchored inflation expectations, we'll have a certain amount of price dispersion that arises from the inattention of agents that are each getting individual signals. But when we go through a high inflation episode, as we all start focusing on the big island, not just the little islands, um, we should have the price dispersion shrinking quite significantly because we are paying attention and the credibility is more at stake if you want. As Benoit said, developing these indicators of credibility and linking them also to the price dispersion will be important. And I conclude with one final relative price that is not in this picture and a relative price dispersion that is central. There's a very important price in the economy, which is the price of your labor, wages. And what we have seen also in the last few years is very large movements in real wages, another form of price dispersion, where the relative price of labor lagged that one of goods and is now catching up. Moreover, that relative price, more even than the supply shocks, is a key component that affects marginal costs in a very differential way across sectors. If one tries to explain some of this dispersion, it turns out that as much as the stock out supply shock kind of indicators is the fact that some sectors are more labor intensive than others and real wages have adjusted at very different speeds in the euro area than the US. Right now, again, to make sense of why the euro area's inflation is falling and that you've seen that in relative prices, quite a bit seems to be linked to the decline in relative wage indicators in the euro area, which is much more pronounced than you see in the US. To conclude, I think thinking about relative prices is an important part, as I said, the last step of the transmission. And hopefully I try to illustrate in these seven, ooh, not seven, nine minutes, um, the extent to which uh, we can look at the different explanations for the inflation and not uh, in terms of their implication for relative prices. Uh, and that hopefully gives you hints not just of what happened, but also of what will happen in the next 12 months. Thank you. Thank you. So, and our last speaker now will be Governor Centeno. And um, you have listened to all the uh, deliberations from the speakers. So we are looking forward to your take on all these uh, views. Well, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Sorry for not being in Frankfurt. Uh, it's uh, been an outstanding conference and 
thank you all um, also uh, that are working in the in the in the network. It's uh, it's a very important topic to to our job. Uh, so congratulations on that. Uh, I had previous commitments to celebrate the 50 years of the Portuguese uh, revolution. Yes, central banks also um, celebrate revolutions, especially uh, of this kind. Uh, and uh, I, I couldn't make it uh, to Frankfurt. Um, but thank you also to Silvia, Benoit uh, and Ricardo. They, uh, they indeed um, will make my, my job easier. And I'd like to respond to your challenge and, and wrap it up um, somehow uh, in, in, in my views and connecting to what we just heard. We arrived to, the, to this inflationary process after eight years and a half of very low inflation. That has been said already. Inflation on average in the previous eight years and a half uh, was below 1%. This was very low inflation. And believe me, uh, we were um, really unhappy um, in, in the governing council. Uh, and we actually uh, even changed um, and revised our monetary policy strategy. And we must uh, remember that um, the first goal uh, of this uh, revision was uh, to increase and to state that we were ready uh, to tolerate inflation above 2% temporarily. The only thing that we uh, were not completely aware uh, uh, was the fact that these uh, that we will be approaching two percent from above instead uh, of from below because that was uh, where we were kind of trapped uh, before before all this uh, inflationary process uh, took off. We even introduced a name for it. We call it symmetry. We were symmetrically um, uh, willing to um, to tolerate again inflation uh, above or below our target, which were even more precisely defined as two percent. So that's that's where uh, we uh, live in terms of our monetary policy strategy, and we must recall that uh, at all times. Then we um, even increased a little bit of a drama, you know, but the, the, the euro area um, is very uh, much prone to, to dramas. Uh, and they take uh, very easily even an existential format. Uh, and we now uh, are skeptical about models. We, uh, so that's why it's so important to listen from Silvia, Benoit and Ricardo. Uh, and, 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 and we shouldn't, uh, because uh, if we really look at the errors that we uh, made uh, in forecasting inflation um, so far, they have not been related to the models. They are uh, mostly hypothesis driven. This was a very long process of inflation going up. It took more than one year since we first add inflation above 2% to reach the peak in October 2022. And, and this succession of shocks increase the potential for contagions beyond the initial shocks uh, of, uh, of inflation. It was an energy shock. It was a supply-driven shock um, in, in, in mostly in the euro area. And <clears throat> given the long period that in which the, those shocks occurred, this uh, was rather painful and, and we were really, um, uh, I mean, uh, in, in a mode that, uh, that uh, increased all uh, concerns uh, about inflation um, entrenchment uh, and uh, whether or not we will be able to bring inflation down to 2%. Well, as a matter of fact, we made a, a significant progress in this inflation. Sylvia showed graphs very clear on that. The ECB did, did its part. Uh, I think we must be uh, happy with what we have been doing so far. But we were not alone. And the transmission of uh, the channels of transmission of monetary policy work 
and worked in the, in, in the euro area because the economic system helped a lot and also because our fiscal policies in the euro area were much more contained than in other jurisdictions. One of the key elements, probably novel for, for us, was the labor market. Let me spend one minute on the labor market. The labor market um, in, in Europe, the results were very clear. We had a, a great deal of real wage flexibility. Real wages in the euro area fell by seven percentage points. We also um, were able to see from the side of firms uh, a cycle of margins that are already slowing and that follow what we will expect uh, from the usual business cycle behavior uh, of margins. And, th and, and those results were obtained because we have a, a, a labor market in Europe today that is way more flexible than the sclerotic and hysteresis driven labor market that we are were used uh, in the latest um, years of, of the 20th century. Flexibility, mobility, uh, reduction in long-term unemployment, reduction in subsidized unemployment, all these uh, are features uh, of the European labor market today that help us explain why uh, we were able not to have and to feel the heat of, uh, uh, of wages and, uh, and, and that made the adjustment in the labor market much, uh, much easier. I even call it uh, the dividend of the labor market. And I truly think that Europe today is living out of a dividend coming from the labor market, from the way it uh, adjusted through, uh, through these years and through all these crises. The reality today is that the Euro area is not growing. It is stalled for one year and a half. Investment has not grown for two years today. And credit over GDP in, in the forecasting horizon, in the latest uh, forecast that we have in the ECB, will reach the lowest levels on record for euro area uh, time. Uh, so these are these are very um, uh, worrisome indicators for the European economy going forward. I think they really reveal the true sacrifice ratio that Europe is facing um, in this fight uh, against against inflation, and those numbers are in sharp contrast to the U.S. So in my take. Monetary transmission was effective in the, area, in the euro area, facing a supply-driven temporary inflationary process. The leveraging is strong, and inflation helps in this deleveraging, of course. But remember, even with inflation approaching 2%, our forecast is for credit over GDP to continue to fall in the euro area in the next two years. If you go back to the labor market and you concentrate on wages, as Ricardo was uh, also uh, mentioning, beyond the seven percentage points, real wages uh, reduction in the euro area way above uh, what happened in the US, we still, uh, we, we still don't see a, a true and consistent recovery of real wages. The most recent information we have for negotiated wage growth in the euro area already for 2024 show negative real negotiated wages in, 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 the, euro, in the euro area. Take Germany. According to the Bundesbank statistics, the real wage, the negotiated wage growth, sorry, is tracking just 2.6% year on year in February, after a peak of only 3.5% in July 2023. Remember that our forecast bases the recovery on consumption. 
And this will not happen with falling real wages. So our forecast is really challenged today, given what we have we are observing in, in, in the labor in the labor market. To conclude, let me just point to um, the following. Most shocks identified for the euro area, for example, those that result from the decoupling from the US, will be deflationary. A further tightening in financial conditions will, or, or the continuation of a very tight policy track, will face harder conditions. Existing buffers are mostly exhausted. In the fiscal side, we will have a, a new uh, stability and growth pact. The, my expectation is that it will take uh, further tightening in the fiscal side in Europe, adding to the more than 20 percentage points divergence in fiscal stimulus between the US and the Euro area. The existing savings from COVID are also, especially in the household side, uh, exhausted. We will be facing a small amount of excess liquidity and the labor market dividend will be probably not there to help us uh, in um, balancing the conditions for, for the euro area in, in the next few years. So um, my take is that the euro area faces risks similar to what we observed back in time as a, a highly coordinated uh, austerity. Those er were errors that we uh, had experienced during the sovereign debt crisis. I risk to say that policies may soon become procyclical if, if not uh, adjusted. And that's not what we expect uh, from, from policies. Uh, and uh, Europe will uh, have a lot to gain if we can go back to uh, a higher degree of coordination between monetary, fiscal, and regulatory policies, the, the type that we observed um, during the, the COVID uh, crisis period. Thank you, Catherine. And I'm more than happy to, to get questions <laughs> next. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think before opening up to the audience, I would go for a very quick round of questions to, to the um, presentations. And um, maybe starting with you, Ricardo, I was wondering how your analysis um, squares with the idea that uh, the last mile bringing inflation down to 2% is the most important one. So you painted a very benign picture saying in the euro area it's already declining very quickly, dispersion is going down. And if you listen to bank analysts, to the media, everybody says, well, the last mile is the hardest one. So, Well, often the last, so. First of all, the benign picture I showed you was only insofar as I was comparing it with the US. It's not that the data is showing that for sure inflation is under control in the euro area. It's simply that it seems to be more so. It's a relative statement, not an absolute statement. Point number one. Point number two, the reason why often the last mile is harder to deal with is precisely because if one has a high inflation episode, and one certainly looks back at the 70s and others, and has this very large relative price dispersion, whether that is driven by frequency of price adjustments, expectations, anchoring, or any of the other facts that I mentioned, it means that then being able to go back to this benign period of inattention, credibility capital, as Bernard would have put it, or simply infrequent price adjustment, consistent with a certain level of relative prices that simply reflect different shocks in different sectors, becomes harder to achieve. One has to reach that new steady state from a scar of the past. If you want, the period of high inflation through all of those different channels leads to a new equilibrium of relative price dispersion that needs to be broken. And if one is not broken, that comes not necessarily with high inflation, but with an inflation that's less anchored, one that is less, one that is somewhat more volatile. 
That last mile is harder because it is indeed an adjustment of all of those structural factors towards the previous one. And I think that's true this time, and it is true before uh, in other high inflation episodes that we have observed. And so that's certainly the case right now. And that's why in some ways right now is a decisive period, not literally right now, but even the last three months and the next three or four months for the ECB and policy to contribute to reach the previous equilibrium as judged by relative price dispersion and their indicators, um, as opposed to staying in a forever higher level. I see Benoit moving when credibility capital is <laughs> mentioned. And I think your, your thesis was that the ECB has built credibility capital by its reaction. So do you agree with Ricardo? So, I mean, in terms of credibility also, uh, uh, with all due respect to uh, Ricardo uh, and, uh, and other commenters uh, in the press, um, I think that especially, I mean, my sense is that in the governing council, uh, they like to talk about this as the last kilometer. Um, <laughs> rather than the last mile, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's also being affirmative about you know, uh, uh, a measure which uh, makes uh, way more sense, and we know the metric system is, uh, <laughs> is, is, is very much superior, but, uh, but for some reason, you know, maybe a, a, a pink page uh, a, a news media is having a big influence uh, on this debate, but um, that, that, that's a side. I, I, I think that in what we've seen yesterday in the, in the presentation by, um, by Isabel, there was this, uh, um, this effect of, of wages on services prices, which uh, was very high. I mean, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 maybe uh, was, was estimated. Uh, this is producer price indices, so, you know, it means that it need not go all the way to CPI. So I think it's still fair to, 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 to assess, even though that's a place where there, there are risks, that we are still unlikely to see a price wage a spiral, but we don't want to be complacent, and we, we, we need to, 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 to look at it very carefully. It, uh, it, it may be the case that, you know, through services, because uh, um, uh, labor becomes more scarce, uh, with aging, uh, higher bargaining power of workers, um, they may be able to obtain uh, catching up on their, on their real wages. Whether this would go all the way to a wage price spiral, that's, that's, that's a higher bar to, to, to go, but I think that's where we want to be particularly uh, focused. Thank you. So Sylvia, in your presentation, I was a little bit surprised that you were very, yeah, benign about the um, spillovers and say no drama, nothing. So I think your presentation somehow highlighted that you have flexible exchange rates and this can buffer and allow for monetary policy independence, which is not what the recent dilemma versus trilemma discussion was suggesting. So I was wondering what is your take on that? So not no spillover of kind of dominant monetary policy to other parts of the globe. I think it, it makes a, a great difference whether you are speaking about a large versus a small economy, right? So I was having in mind, you know, the euro area, and I think not much has changed from what, you know, the condition that we had in this respect, you know, since 2008 or 2015. So I also show you that even in periods of very large divergence, think of 2014-15, the euro area was uh, having negative rates, the, the Fed was increasing rates, the euro area was doing QE. Even then, we didn't have an unduly, you know, um, reaction or a very large reaction of the exchange rate. We know that the invoicing system makes a difference. Uh, yes, if we compare the exchange rate impact in the U.S. versus, you know, the past in the U.S. versus the euro area, the euro area is a bit more, but still the euro area is not uh, Switzerland or, or Sweden, right? So I think these considerations are important. I think in general to, to what the other, you know, panelists have said, I, I just maybe throw um, a, a question to Ricardo or a comment back. Uh, I think it's very important what, what Ricardo says that, you know, central banks, uh, maybe in the last kilometers are going to do, you know, a lot. And it's very important to, to bring back, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the system where it was before. But I think it's also important for the euro area to remember what the governor said, that pre this shock, 
the euro area had a deposit rate of minus 50 basis point and inflation uh, below target for a long period of time. So I think we need to be careful in wishing where do we want to take back, uh, you know, we, which is our steady state equilibrium that we want to, um, to aim for. And, and in that, uh, again, I, I know I, I would have not had time to, to present, but like I put some wage data on a forward looking basis and, you know, some contracts for Italy, they're very interesting. Some sector that just renegotiate after many years for long term contracts that last four or five uh, years. And you have, you know, average annualized growth of, of wages of, of 2%, uh, you know, in a sector that covers about, you know, 16% of the workforce. So uh, higher than 0.9, but still 2% nominal wage growth on average over the next until 2026. So, yeah, that, that, that are my considerations. Thank Obviously, you. the U.S. is in a different spot completely on wage growth. Now, that brings a nice segue to the intervention of uh, Governor Centeno. So, you mentioned a large range of issues and indicators and so And I was wondering, so as a policymaker, you have to take decisions under uncertainty. And I guess, so this is the inaugural conference for... Um, a network for research on monetary policy transmission. So where do you see gaps? Which kind of analysis you would like to have at hand to uh, take monetary policy decisions? Yes, that's a very nice question. <laughs> and I'll take the opportunity to, to, to ask for some, some uh, uh, more uh, knowledge uh, around uh, one, 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 one key issue is this, is this labor market. It is really not uh, being taken uh, fully in, in consideration in, in, our, in our analysis. For example, take the NIRU. Uh, in, in, the, in our models, the NIRU barely moves um, in, in the last uh, five, ten years. Uh, and and that's not um, that's not compatible with the degree uh, of um, flexibility and adjustment capacity that we see today uh, in the European labor market. Uh, there's a number that that strikes me uh, as uh, probably the number that 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 we need to remind ourselves uh, uh, at all times uh, in in the in the current process. Uh, Fifty percent of the employment gains. Uh, in Europe, uh, which uh, was 10 million jobs uh, in the last uh, five years, uh, is um, uh, those jobs are held by people that are working in a country different from the country in which they were born. This is this is migration and mobility numbers that uh, are uh, U.S. type of numbers at at the U.S. best, <laughs> and 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 we didn't have that in Europe. Before. So we really need to go back and, and to see what does this mean um, to, the, to the capacity of Europe um, to, to, to adjust. Uh, and also to fill the gap between um, what we see in these numbers for uh, mobility and the productivity impact in the euro area as well. Because we always claim that uh, uh, productivity in Europe is trailing the US, uh, and this is a this is not a novelty. This is something that is going on already for many years. But we need to go to the numbers and see uh, how much this um, new uh, adjustment uh, mechanism in the labor market help us uh, in that in that respect. Um, and 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 if we go back to this issue of of the last kilometer. Let's let's face it. I mean, this is a convergence process, and uh, as Sylvia was pointing out, uh, we don't we, we really don't want to go back to to pre-COVID uh, uh, period in terms of inflation, and landing inflation at two percent is very difficult. The latest number we have is two point four. Two point four is in round terms two as much as 1.6. Are we going to be able to land inflation at 2% or allow it to, um, to fluctuate between, say, 1.6, 1.8, and 2.2, 2.3? 2 
I mean, we are there. <laughs> Let's face it. I mean, we will not have inflation at 2%. Uh, I, I, uh, as a joke, uh, I sometimes say that uh, if, if our statistical office uh, produces inflation of 2%, I will have serious doubts <laughs> about that because that, that's, that's a, a very unlikely event. Uh, the economic conditions in Europe uh, prior to the, to the inflationary process were not delivering inflation at all. Uh, we did not change that substantially. So uh, there was no de-anchoring of expectations through this process. I mean, maybe one month, maybe a couple of uh, events, but in substance, inflation is and, and, and remain really anchored uh, those expectations at 2% for the euro area. We are paying much more than other jurisdictions to disinflate. And that's, that's a concern for Europe. And we need to face it. And we need to be ready to, to, to adapt to that. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a large audience in this room and uh, I would now like to open up the floor for questions to the audience. And uh, again, please uh, stand up, say your name and your affiliation. And um, for the panelists, I look for signals from your side who would like to take the question, except if uh, they are exclusively addressed to somebody of you. So there's Philip, Paolo. Thank you, Philip Hartmann, ECB. Uh, I'm so glad that we have a directive in the European Union that opposes, imposes the metric system on, on us, on all of us. Because if you look at the latest inflation figures across the Atlantic, then the last kilometer seems to be not easy, but slightly easier than the last mile. It's so <laughs> that joke didn't go down very well. Um, <laughs> but two remarks. So first, uh, uh, on Ricardo, I just wanted to report that we have in Champ actually a project going on uh, that unfortunately we couldn't display today um, because it's uh, still ongoing and preliminary that looks precisely at the impacts of monetary policy on the different components of core inflation, which is one form of dispersion and granularity. Uh, and I, the first uh, things I've seen looked extremely interesting to distinguish which parts actually reacted more because we still have that the core inflation uh, measures are, are still higher than the headline inflation. So they still have to go some, some way to come down. So there would be something that in your direction to, to make progress on the CHAMP. Um, more on the policy side, I wanted to um, uh, uh, you know, raise uh, an issue to uh, Governor Sentinel because I mean, one of the challenges, okay, many, some of these energy shocks have uh, reversed, no? But the total terms of trade shock that the euro faces relative to the rest of the world through the different crises that we have faced, uh, there will be a persistent part in it. So that do, does imply that resources are, uh, you know, uh, allocated in a way that we, quote unquote, become relatively poorer relative to the rest of the world, like energy intensive countries and, and, uh, and, and, and other countries. So uh, moreover, uh, the latest productivity figures, as also Isabel showed in her introductory speech yesterday, uh, don't look very promising. So actually one critical element is going to be the recovery in productivity. And so against this background, you emphasized rightly so obviously the uh, recovery in real wages and how much hangs on it for um, balancing the inflation objective with growth and employment developments. Uh, but um, the question is when we look at these numbers, don't we have to take two into account that there are two important factors that may also put some limitations, which is these uh, terms of trade losses and uh, potentially uh, uh, relative to the US and some other constituencies, a weak productivity that we have right now, which naturally puts some limits on uh, wage recovery. Okay. Would you like Stefano? Uh, Stefano as well? Yeah. So, very interesting. Stefano Neri, Banca Italia. So, uh, I want to connect uh, Benoit's remarks with those of Governor Centeno. And, and the point is, I'm really worried about these mistrusting models. Uh, and I think that is 
uh, not really good, doesn't bode well for credibility of the institution of a central bank. So I would, you know, wanted to ask uh, more in detail your views about this link between credibility and, and uh, trust and models. I think it's really problematic to show mistrust in models. They clearly fail, but they fail, as Governor said, because of the, the assumptions. So if I want to convince you with an argument that is based on wrong assumptions, I don't think I will manage in my task. So I think we have to really bear in mind that. And I think even looking forward for possible next strategy review, I think that is a part that would be a very important part of the story. And then a general remark on this last mile slash last kilometers. Uh, I'm not a long distance runner, but I was told once that it's not the last mile or slash last kilometer that creates problems. Uh, that happens about 30 kilometers since the beginning. That's where your body wants to stop. And that's when you need your mind to continue going. So I think the ECB is already behind that time. So when they resisted the temptation to stop raising rates and continue in the fight against inflation to keep inflation expectation anchored. So I don't really buy this story about the last mile. I think we're, the ECB has done a great job in resisting temptations. And I don't think the last mile is really a major concern. Thank you. So I'd like to collect uh, in view of the time. Are there any more? So there, over there. Um, hi, Federico Uglisi, a Bank of Italy fellow. Um, so my question is related to uh, Ricardo's uh, uh, discussion of uh, mainly tangentially um, attention and dispersion and Silvia's discussion of the uh, divergence between, potential divergence between uh, uh, real rates in the US and Euro area. So I was wondering, um, as exchange rates didn't change in the previous period and media attention though of investors is, is increasing, right? Uh, um, uh, the attention is increasing on this uh, uh, on this uh, gap that potentially might appear between the US and Euro area, should we be concerned at all about capital flows or coordinating uh, uh, coordinated capital outflows from the Euro area elsewhere? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? So then I think we can go for a final round of um, replies, and I would go in the same order as we started, so Benoit. Would you like to? Yes. So uh, thanks. Thanks for for the for for the question on on, on the role of models. I, I I think you know, and and my experience in uh, in in the euro system uh, showed me that uh, um, using models and bringing conclusions from models to uh, to to the policymakers is 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 done uh, with uh, um, judgment and also with um, um, some uh, some care in uh, you know not not trusting the model too much and 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 so you want to have several models to to look at. I think for the point that the the, the main point I was making in the in the recent episode is that even with a relatively wide um, uh, uncertainty on on what you believe to be the slope of the Phillips curve. You know, even if you have a, a fairly high Phillips curve, the type of slowdown that we've experienced in the uh, euro area and that uh, Governor Santano mentioned would not bring more than, uh, uh, you know, maybe 2% uh, inflation. And, and we've seen inflation going from 10% to 2.4. So uh, it has to be that it came from another part of the, of the equation, and this other part of the equation that is you know, it's, uh, there's no final proof, but it's, it's in my view, uh, convincing uh, is this expectation attractor. Uh, uh, and, and we see imperfect measures of inflation expectations that we collect from surveys, from financial markets. We see that they're anchored. We see that they have increased and came down. And, uh, and this explanation of, which is model-based, you know, it's based on, on, on a Phillips curve, of uh, the disinflation, I think it's con it's convincing, uh, but uh, but yeah, again, there's, there's never a final proof. In terms of uh, what role uh, models should have in the forthcoming review of uh, of the monetary policy strategy of, of, of the ECB or of other central banks, for that matter, 
that's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a very interesting uh, exercise, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to, to the work that will be done and, and published uh, in, in this respect, but I don't have uh, more uh, of a view of you know, what should be done. Thank you. So, Sylvia, you got a question on capital flows, but feel free to also react to any other remarks that you found um, yeah, interesting. Uh, thank you. I mean, on, on the capital flows, um, again, I think it's a matter of uh, divergence. I think we have seen large capital, and, and, and also considering that we are talking about two large, you know, uh, relatively closed economies on, on the trade, on the capital, very open and integrated. I mean, we really have seen large capital outflows away from Europe in the period of the European sovereign crisis, right, when we were thinking about the periphery versus core, but, you know, it was also an intra- a euro area um, thing. So I don't think we should be that worried unless we have, again, in, in, in shocks that are, are size of, uh, of the size that, that are the one that I mentioned before. On other comments, maybe I would, um, you know, uh, just pick on, on the, the question that the remarks that Philip Hartman had. Um, I think it's, uh, we, we would all agree with you that, you know, the, the if the terms of trade shock is not fully reversed, maybe some, as you say, you know, we, somehow we should be poorer. But I think it's a matter of degree. If we look at how weak real wages have been uh, and are relative to pre-COVID, there is still a long way to go before we recover that. I think on your own forecast, you know, real wages, if I'm not wrong, are supposed to go back to pre-COVID level by the end of 25. But also, if you think about some trend, right, it would take even longer. And then on labor productivity, again, you know, I think I, I agree. I mean, it's very low, but it's maybe the $1 trillion question. How much is structural? How much is cyclical? Uh, we, we don't have a good grasp of it. To the extent that structural other policies um, are better to deal with it than monetary policies, but to the extent that some weakness is cyclical, uh, I think, you know, that the monetary policy stands could help reversing part of it. Thank you. Uh, Ricardo, I'm sure you are happy to hear that your ideas are already uh, taken up in CHAMP projects, but I'm sure that you will have further ideas. And <laughs> sure, no, I want to make three <laughs> comments just following up on the discussion more than answering a question, but three comments that, hope, well, I hope will be useful. First, on this last kilometer, now it's been used so many ways in the last 30 minutes that I'm not sure what it means anymore, but let me tell you what I think it means uh, and the, in the way it relates to my uh, presentation. By last kilometer, what I think is that right now, the transmission of monetary policy and the convergence of inflation is very fast right now. That the relative prices are just stabilizing, that we're at a time, like Benoit said, where you see a bit of a sensitivity, quite a bit of a sensitivity of uh, financial prices and the pricing of inflation risk and others to what's going on now. You see it even, going again to the other side of the Atlantic, to the very large swing we had between a Fed that effectively cut in December through speeches to now reverting to almost raising through speeches within the space of a few months. I think the transition is very fast. That's what the thing we said the last mile, not that we're not going there, not that whether the inflation is here or not, we'll see, but the fact that, as I try to say and the discussion says, this is actually a decisive moment and is really the opposite of I, I'm happy to say it's a benign, but not a complacent moment, exactly the opposite of complacency. That it is different insofar as it's the, what I was trying to say, the new steady state. Second, and on, the, on, it, on those terms, uh, like Governor Centeno said, I could not agree more that 2.4, come on, that's rounding here. Look again at my relative prices. It's really 2.42, it's just, we, we should not fool economic agents that the central bank has any ability to control that. At the same time, and the reason why I'm very, very sensitive to that argument and agree with it wholeheartedly, is that there was an argument, of course, that I felt, and some others in the room did as well, in 2015 when it was 1.6 instead of 2.4. What's the big deal? It's 1.6, it's close enough to two. And yet, as both Sylvia and Governor Centeno said, back in 2020, they were having, I think it was Governor Centeno who said, they were having an existential crisis about 1.6. And what, was, what made an existential crisis about 1.6 is that it was 1.6 for five or six or seven years in a row. So absolutely, there's nothing wrong with 2.4 this year. Trying to hit two this year should not be in any way a, an overwhelming existential problem. But worrying about being stuck at 2.4 for the next six years, that is an issue. And that is, again, why I go back to mine. Now I think is a crucial time to both be benign but not complacent. 
uh, in terms of what we think. And then thirdly, on the, uh, and thirdly, in conclude on those terms, um, and relating a little bit to some of the other points made, I think an important lesson about monetary policy, I might even say the most central one, and this goes back to the use of models, is that models, in the sense of theoretical principles, are very important in telling us what you can do and what you cannot do. The big mistakes, as Christina Romer, a great historian of monetary policy, wrote very emphatically 15 years ago, the biggest mistake a central bank can make is think that it cannot do anything about inflation. And central banks did that sometimes and sometimes do that, including dangerously when we had inflation being too low and some central banks started saying, well, there's nothing we can do about the 1.6. Yes, you can. And when you think you can't, that's when inflation problems happen. But secondly, on the other side, and going back, of course, to the other, another great monetary historian, Milton Friedman, and, or two, and Anna Schwartz, when the central bank thinks that it can do something about movements in the Nairo and real developments, that's also when often problems, very, very serious problems arise. And so when, when I hear some of the issues that were raised by different participants, again, Governor Centeno and Sylvia uh, Benoit a little bit, of we may be having tough times ahead in terms of uh, what's happening to real wages, productivity, investment, credit, to what extent do those lead us to, um, or those should lead us to adjust monetary policy, to think about it, but not with the perspective that we can change those, monetary policy and control inflation, but rather that those developments may mean that we have to reassess our measures of our star, and that maybe going back then to the last kilometer, the 1.6, 2.4, then maybe, we, maybe if our stars are higher for all of those negative developments, maybe we do need higher interest rates for longer that are actually not so contractionary as you may think, precisely for those developments. Which is a very different view from saying because of all those developments we need to cut rates very quickly because we need to revert them. Do you think that in some of those developments, I think a very useful model exercise is to go through the list that we went through and Governor Centeno did it very well, and think for which of these do we think that monetary policy can do something about, and for which can it not do something about? And I think that's a very enlightening, very model-based way of thinking through those challenges and concluding from them whether uh, we are doing too much, too little, where the last kilometer it's more important to cut faster or rather to hold for a little longer. Thank you. So thank you, Ricardo. After so much talk about the last kilometer, I think what is sure, so Governor Centeno, you will have the privilege of the last word in this panel. <laughs> it's, it's much better to have the last word than, than being in the last kilometer, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'm, I'm with, with both. Uh, just a, just a, a short uh, introduction to, to decision making. Uh, and, and you know, I've, I've been into it <laughs> Uh, for quite some time and there's always a degree of risk and we we should take it we should acknowledge uh, we should communicate it it's it's the only way we have um, facing decisions that sometimes we portray as difficult uh, and they are never easy uh, but uh, but uh, but we need to communicate them very well um, even more so in monetary policy, the number of times we mentioned the word expectation um, in, in this uh, panel uh, is very clear, uh, a very clear um, statement uh, towards this communication um, uh, requirements. And, and, and um, we need to bring others to the table. I, I've been... Um, uh, arguing for that uh, in Europe. In Europe, we didn't achieve yet the maturity level uh, that will bring different decision makers um, to the same room uh, to, um, to discuss uh, and to uh, understand uh, each other's uh, role um, in this process. And uh, again, Europe is facing a high sacrifice in fighting inflation, that is not being the case in other jurisdictions. And we need to be very clear uh, about it so that um, our stakeholders, which are, are those to which we direct our policies, will understand us. Otherwise, we lose credibility. We don't have uh, an audience <laughs> able to understand what is going on with us and, and with our decisions. 
so now on, on the questions, <laughs> it is it is um, clear and and Philip stated it very well. I mean, uh, in terms of trade, I don't know exact the exact numbers, but um, there was some recovery into in 2023, and there will be a further recovery in 2024 of the terms of trade. That's what we expect, uh, but uh, uh, but we are not yet there. So who is paying for that? Certainly wages. I mean, the loss in real wages in Europe is huge. Go go and tell workers after losing seven percentage points in the real wages that we are worried about the path of recovery of those wages. In a healthy labor market, that's what is going next. And it's not only in a healthy labor market, it's in a recovery uh, the recovery capacity of the euro area. So we need to be able to communicate what is the level of wages that we think is compatible with inflation going to 2% and the uh, real risk of um, second round effects not materializing. So far, they di it didn't. Uh, materialize. We need to be very clear uh, about that so that we can communicate, and we need to 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 get to 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 this uh, paradox of productivity. Uh, there may be composition effects. Uh, time to learn, so that productivity increases after uh, some some period in the job. We know, nevertheless, that especially in 2023, the majority of jobs in the euro area is being created in sectors that pay above average and that we classify uh, as either uh, technologically advanced of knowledge intensive services sector jobs. So if this is the case, we need to be patient. These things do not happen instantaneously. Uh, we need to preserve the labor market conditions. And I, um, a, a, a few months ago, the previous um, president of the Australian um, Central Bank uh, made a very in interesting comment on uh, monetary policy in Australia being able to preserve the progress made by the labor market in Australia. And I think we need to also, and I'm very uh, clear about this, we need also to think about it in, in the euro area. Because it is with the labor market that we have to share part of the success that Europe had fighting inflation. And we need to design our policies to preserve this success. So, Yes, Philip, please go to the numbers <laughs> with uh, all our colleagues in the Euro system. There are very talented economists there. We, we need to get an answer to the productivity paradox that apparently we are facing because uh, firms are not charities. They don't create employment for the sake of creating employment. They don't hoard labor just for the sake of hoarding labor. Uh, we need to understand that better, and uh, uh, I'm sure that the numbers we see, both in terms of employment and wages, are compatible. So wage restraint in the labor area made it possible for employment to continue at these very high levels that we still see today. And on, on this last kilo kilometer, uh, well, look, uh, inflation took more than one year to peak, 10.6% October 2022. It's at 2.4 now. It came down much faster than, than it went up. This is especially true for services. It is true that now we see a little bit of a stagnation in that disinflation process, but nevertheless, services inflation came down faster and core as well than, than, than it went up. So we, we need to, to, to understand 
that this is a convergence to a, to, to a, a new equilibrium that we didn't have before. It is true that on occasion, as, uh, as, as Ricardo was pointing out, uh, inflation was uh, close enough to 2% before COVID, but that was not the norm by then. Uh, and, and we need to, to understand that landing at 2% without creating a recession and without overshooting on the response from monetary policy side is not an easy task and we need by all means, not to undershoot. The inflation in our projection in 2024 will be below 2% already in the summer. Then it will fluctuate around 2 before stabilizing slightly below 2%. This is what we have in our forecast. And we cannot uh, start breaking uh, and easing monetary the, the financial tightening when we are at two because there's a huge mass of impacts that will follow still because of the lag uh, of monetary policy transmission because the system will be still working under some degree of tightness and and we really risk uh, doing more than it's needed in an economy that that doesn't grow, doesn't invest. And, and I don't see how, uh, if we don't somehow ad adapt the policy trajectory to it, uh, we'll, we'll deliver not even these meager results <laughs> that we see today. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. So this brings the panel to a close. So, and I would like to thank very much all the panelists and I'm sure that you're going to join me in thanking them and um, see you later.